I think the Fed is pushing on a string. Uh, there's seven trillion dollars of programs, three different programs that you know from the so-called Inflation Reduction Act <laughs> and a whole host of other programs that the federal government is spending money on, mountains of money like we've never seen before. And best I can account of the seven trillion they've announced, they've probably spent something like two and a half. Mm. To say that hasn't created inflation is totally ignoring the elephant in the room. Yep. It has created a big part of this inflation. And the Fed adjusting interest rates is not going to squash the power of that $7 trillion coming at us. I thought a good place to start would be something that we share in common. And you told me about the other day. You said I suffered with ADHD, which you tend to find in entrepreneurs. But can you expand on why you thought that might be something we could talk about? Yeah, I was never diagnosed as a young kid, but I definitely had it. And later in life, as I went through, you know, various medical treatments and examinations, it was something that was identified. But it really became an issue for me when I went to the University of Texas and I was studying electrical engineering. Um, you know, there was a lot of studying involved. I signed up for way too many hours and I just became overwhelmed with the workload and right. I just wasn't able to to keep up at first. But one thing I did is I had built my own stereo from scratch and I love music. OK. So I decided to hook up uh, the stereo to some some decent headphones at the time. Nothing like what I have on today, but at the <laughs> time they were pretty good. And I started listening to classical music as well as a particular artist named Leo Kotke, who seldom sung, but he played a 12 string guitar and he was amazing. And listening to that music, I could totally dial into whatever I was studying mm. and it just it was miraculous. And so I suddenly became really great at studying and I could condense it into a short period of time by simply listening to music on these headphones. It took everything in the outside world away from me and I could totally focus. Do you still do that today? I do it occasionally, okay. um, but I don't necessarily wear the headphones. I'll just have the music on in background, yep. but it really calms me down and it enables me to focus on one thing at a time and not jump around. We're going to we're going to pick up on that later on because you manage a lot and so we can talk about how you're how you prioritize. Um you left UT and you were in accounting. And I think in today's world, I think accounting's always probably been something everybody's like, "I don't really want to study accounting." Yeah. But the numbers don't lie and they are the language of business. And today's and today kids want to um, major in all these crazy things. But accounting seems to always be the one that I, when I listen to a lot of investors or read about them, accounting plays a background. Can you just explain how accounting's impacted your entire career and why you chose it early on? Well, the reason I chose it is I was going through an internship program with Dow Chemical okay. uh, when I was studying electrical engineering. They desperately needed engineers. There was a shortage at the time. And so I knew I was going to have a job there and I actually loved electrical engineering. It was, but there were no girls, <laughs> none. Um, and, you know, the, not that there's anything wrong with this, but there was just not a lot of people that I had a, a lot in common with on a social level. OK. Um, so in my third summer of interning with Dow, I interfaced with the business people on a chemical plant that was being built in Brazil. OK. Um, I didn't get to go to Brazil, but I was in Freeport, Texas, and I was interfacing at a at a table like this. And there were all these business people on one side and there were all these engineers on the other. And I quickly realized I was on the wrong side of the table. <laughs> OK, so I went back to school. I changed my major. I had to cram all of my electrical engineering and physics and crazy math courses into my electives. Yeah. And I got through accounting um, and graduated one semester late. But uh, and did some summer school, but got through it. And uh, it was a wonderful degree. Uh, it was actually very hard. Even back then, that was the number one accounting program in the nation, still is. And 
but I, I thrived in it, uh, learned a heck of a lot. And, and the application of accounting and business is just, it's an everyday thing. Yep. Um, and I would really, you know, fast forwarding in my career, I would attribute that training to why perhaps Richard Rainwater saw something in me okay. and thought this guy can rip apart a financial statement because I've seen him do it as well as anybody. And that's what I need. So that is a perfect lead into where I want to spend some time because there's been bits and clips of you talking about <laughs> rainwater. And I reached out to a lot of people and said, what can I talk to John about? And a lot of it was like, let's talk about how rainwater influenced your life. So maybe a good place to start would be, can you just tell me a little bit about Richard? What, why was he so great? Uh, just an amazing man. Uh, very simple yet complicated. Um, I, I stumbled into Richard while uh, working out. Uh, after hours, we worked out at the same time uh, at the city club here in Fort Worth, and we became somewhat friendly just talking while working out. And then he decided um, he wanted me to do some actual work for him. I was at at the time Pete Marwick, now KPMG, and KPMG had the Bass account, which was a very important relationship for the firm. Richard was chief investment officer at the Bass family at the time, and he asked the firm to assign me to him. Mm -hmm. And so I literally got to sit in his office for days, weeks, hours <laughs> uh, at a time. It was uh, it was just an amazing experience. And anything he needed done, I would do, whether it was analyzing a financial statement or helping him with his personal finances, et cetera. And then when he left the Basses in 1986, he soon thereafter in early 87, gave me a call and said, I want you to join me. So I did. And what was the culture like in those early days? Because you've heard about it maybe with Trammell Crow, where all these descendants of Trammell have gone on to do great things. You now hear that with, you know, uh, the Tiger Cubs, but Rainwater now is proving, I mean, it's in hindsight that you find out this is true, but you look all around the country and he put out some incredible business people. Or at least he was linked to them. It was it was a very unique place. Okay, um, I I say that it was akin to a pickup basketball game. Okay, every day was different. You never knew who was going to come into the office. One day it might be Michael Milken. The next day it was, um, uh, you know Eisner who was running Disney, or you just you never knew. Yeah. Um, and within the office, we had a perception that we were quite large. Yep. And we had all this capital. We really didn't. <laughs> it was not, it was not all that big. There were relationships where there was capital. Right. But when Richard left the Basses, uh, best I recall, there was he had like fifty or sixty million dollars. It was a lot of money. Yep. Um, but not billions. Yep. And there were only a few of us, and very few people were really paid anything. Okay. It was just. The ability to hang around this great mind was truly unique. And so there were a lot of businesses that were started within that, within that, those four walls. Um, I remember when I was there, we had Rick Scott creating, you know, a big major healthcare company that became the largest healthcare company in the world. Uh, you had Ken Hirsch starting Natural Gas Partners and you had Mort Meyerson who had sold EDS to General Motors and had left and was looking to do his next big thing. Um, George W. Bush literally sat in my office for weeks <laughs> while we worked on putting the Ranger deal together. Yep. Uh, this was before he was even governor. In fact, when he came in one day and said, I'm going to run for governor, I said, you can't do that, George. You're too too much of a smart ass. And he said, no, I tone that down. <laughs> He's uh, But anyway, it was just a, a very incredible place that just had all this talent coming through the doors. And I was very fortunate to be there. Was he a great investor or was he amazing at spotting talent and giving them the backing they need to exploit the talents that they had or both? I would say both. Okay. Um, Richard had a great investing mind. Yep. Um, very big picture. One thing he always told me is he said, John, get your ideas off the front page of the paper, yep. 
not the business section. Yep. This was back in the day when we actually read newspapers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still do. Um, and that was, um, you know, that's what he looked for trends. He looked for, he looked for contrarian plays, things where everyone was exiting. Um, and that's where he might, might found, find a way to enter. You know, so in the late 80s, it was the oil and gas industry. In the early 90s, I decided to focus on real estate. You know, there were, uh, it was all very much contrarian. But he was also incredibly good at attracting great talent. Yep. Uh, during that same time period, Eddie Lampert left Goldman Sachs, started his hedge fund in our offices. Um, so it was just this amalgamation of incredible talent. And he was very good at attracting that talent, but never paid him. But how did he attract that? There had to have been a magnet to it. Is it like what? Why did everybody that was so great want to be in that office? Is it because was it like a super team in the NBA that once you have LeBron and a few people on the team, then everybody just wants to be there? Or was it something about him that was pulling people in? He was a wonderful cheerleader. Um, the energy and enthusiasm that he brought to the table every day yep. was contagious. And. I I think I learned from that. I tended to be much more introverted, but he, you know, what he saw in me, I'm not real sure. Yeah. Um, but he saw something bigger than I saw. Yep. And he believed in me and he just let me run. And it was that way with everyone there. He really gave them a lot of rope. He never told anyone what to do. Never. I don't know that I ever heard Richard say, go do this. How did you know, how did people know, so you, you, you take a typical company, maybe focused on one thing, making iced tea, maybe you can measure their job a little bit better. Are you doing a good job or not? But I picture these absolute stone cold killers all over the office. How did people know if they were doing a good job? Is it because they were on to a great business idea and it was starting to form? Because I talked to Wilkie in that episode and I asked him like what it was like to work around you and he said... John never really did the same. He never told me what to do. And he was OK if years went by and an idea didn't percolate. But you kind of have this sense that somebody's doing a good job. How did you know you were doing or how did anybody in the office know they were doing a good job for Richard? He um, threw results. Uh, threw results. OK. He was. Impatient in certain ways, but very patient in others. Um, but he. He would help raise capital. Um, that is one area he, he could attract capital to a great idea. Yep. So if he saw a great idea and he saw traction and he saw results, he could help that entrepreneur or business person attract the capital to grow that business. Yep. So that was uh, that was a very important part of his success. OK. And I got there was no better cheerleader on the planet. He would say things about me or others that frankly were a stretch of the truth but richard could pull that off because he was so playful in the way he discussed things people gave him a lot of latitude yep in that discussion and they never took everything literally that he said yep that patient part um i was talking to a guy who i know you probably know in town but they have a, a big family office and i asked him i said what made that guy so great and i'll tell you at lunch who it was um and he said his uh, when everybody else wants to sell the company or ditch it his patience to stick with it is what's created a lot of the success most people just can't think that long um and it sounds like that's the same with richard all right, we're getting closer to Crescent starting, but there was there was something that we talked about that I just thought was really interesting. You and I have talked about raising capital and how it's gotten harder and there's gatekeepers and consultants. And you told me a story about maybe JP Morgan having an office at Rainwater's office and how things worked back in the 80s and 90s. I just think this is fascinating for people to know. So can you describe that situation, maybe how it worked? Yeah, this, this all goes back to that. Um creativity, playfulness, lightheartedness that Richard had. We, it actually was a banker's trust at the time. It was a big lender to buyouts and, you know, they were kind of on the cutting edge of uh, financing and corporate transactions back at the time. And there was a particular banker there that we liked and he was in our office a lot. And then one day Richard just playfully said, 
hey, Chuck, just open an office here in our office because you're here all the time anyway. You can have this office right, right next to John. And so Chuck called headquarters. And at the time, you know, the banking regulations, et cetera, were a little different than they are today. And lo and behold, he officed with us. So yeah. we literally had a bank within our offices and he got to look at everything we did. Didn't do it all, but yeah. he could pick and choose. So it was just uh, – <laughs> It was just a crazy place, you know, that had um, that was very organic. Uh, it was ne you never knew what was going to happen from day to day yeah. or who might be in the office. And you could come out of a meeting with an idea and just walk into his office and say, we might need some capital for this. And that's how capital formation might get started. Yeah. Uh, to segue to to Crescent. Yep. Um, the 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 origin of the idea that I had was actually dates back to. Roger Staubach coming into the office in the late 80s. Okay. And Roger was in trouble. He had invested in a lot of real estate deals and uh, they had not worked out, but no real estate deals worked out that were had the origin in the 80s. Yep. And he, Roger was trying to figure out how to get out of it. And Richard said, well, I'm not going to give you any capital, but what I will do is assign John to you to see if he can help you through it. So I got Roger was, gosh, a, you know, I idolized the guy. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing just to be with him. Um, and so I spent time unraveling, helping him unravel from these bad real estate deals. And he did so in stellar fashion and was so professional through that process. But the one thing I identified was Roger had this tenant representation business, which there really wasn't anybody in that industry at the time. He had, okay. he had kind of, in a way, created it. And I said, Roger, you can open any door in corporate, corporate America, other than maybe Washington, D.C., yeah. home of the Redskins <laughs> at the time, and uh, which ironically became his largest office and one of the, one of the most profitable. Uh, but I said, that business is actually doing really well. You should never do another real estate investment. You ought to focus on tenant rep. And we would love to buy part of that business. So we bought 20 percent of the company. I went on the board and. We paid a million bucks for 20% of the company. It was doing 5 million in uh, revenue and a million in cash flow, you know? So yeah. we, we kind of paid a five multiple and it ended up that $1 million became worth close to 80 million bucks over time. Uh, when I went back to Richard and told him we were going to invest in this, he said, why are we messing with something so small? And the reason was because I didn't, when I started with Richard, I didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. So it was something I could own a meaningful part of. Yep. And I loved Roger. And to this day, we're best friends. Yep. And he ultimately sold that business for over $700 million to yep. Jones Lang LaSalle. And, um, but more importantly, what I, what I got out of it was this incredible insight as to where companies were moving and why they were moving there. Yep. So day, we, we see it in spades today. Yep. But back then, there was a lot of in-migration into the most overbuilt part of the United States, which was right here in our backyard. Yep. So I thought, wow, there's really not a lot of interesting things to do in the corporate buyout world at the time or buying distressed debt other than real estate. Yep. So I went to Richard with a yellow pad, one sheet of paper, had an idea sketched out. And I said, I want to create a real estate company. And this was over lunch, just the two of us sitting in a conference room. And he said, I love it, but you got to put up your entire net worth and I'll allocate, you know, a certain amount of capital. So that was how Crescent was born. What was on that piece of paper? Well, the number one asset on the, I had a list okay. from top down to the assets I wanted to own. Okay. The number one asset was the Crescent in Dallas. It had been completed in 1986. Carolyn Rose Hunt did a, you know, an amazing job of building an iconic asset to this day still gets some of the highest rents in the, in the state. Yep. And, uh, but it was over leveraged and it was built before it's time. Yep. So it was under occupied at the time, but I thought if any building's going to get occupied, it's this one. And so we bought it by buying the debt. So there was over a half a billion invested in it. Uh, we bought the debt piece by piece over a, long period of time. Richard got very nervous with me along the way. And we had a lot of late night calls that were nerve wracking. I yeah. wouldn't sleep for days, uh, but we bought it for 172 million. And uh, 
that was the, you know, I'd say the cornerstone to what was the company that I then took public in, in, uh, in 1994. Okay, real quick. You said you were buying debt piece by piece, so it wasn't just one lender. How does that work? Where you're buying it piece by piece? Yeah, as uh, as I recall, there were like twelve lenders. Oh wow! Um, okay, in the credit, and there was a guarantee by Mrs. Hunt on a like one hundred and fifty million of the debt. Yep. So that complicated things. The banks had relied upon that guarantee to get repaid. Okay. Um. The debt amount in total, as I recall, was three hundred seventy-five million. Wow! And she had a lot of equity in it, but the equity was at that time gone. Yep. Um, and so what I was able to do was to create a partnership with her to allow her to buy out of her guarantee yep. and get equity, part of the equity, as we contributed it to the public company. Yep. And that became she ended up doing really well, which was wonderful. You know, we didn't want didn't wish ill will on her because uh, she had built a great asset. But um, anyway, that we bought those banks out piece by piece, and it was this is very complicated. And yeah, when I originally called all the banks and said, "Hey, I'm here. I'd love to buy your debt." They all told me to go away. We have a guarantee. But what happened was uh, First Republic Bank was the lead lender. They failed, and so suddenly the FDIC was in the lead bankroll and they just, so now you had a ship without a rudder. And so I started getting calls from the banks. Are you still interested? We may want to sell. And, um, we, I was able to buy them out over it. It, it took a couple of years. Well, you did the comp the company didn't start though as a public company. You eventually went public or did it start day one as a public entity? No, it was uh, private. Okay. It was impossible to find the capital. Okay. Somehow I scratched and clawed and found it but it was very, very difficult. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the yellow pad for a second. Plan one, buy the Crescent. Mm -hmm. What else was, was what was after that? Buy more iconic assets like the Crescent or was there a, a more to the plan? Yeah, it was, uh, it was just a list of the top assets in the state. Okay. So primarily based right here in the Metroplex. So, you know, Trammell Crow Center, Fountain Place, and ultimately we did acquire those assets. So the thesis was buy the best located office buildings in the best markets that we can. Yeah, it was my feeling everything theoretically is for sale right. because everything at that moment in time was over leveraged. Yep. So there was going to be stress whether or not we would be able to buy it or the ownership was strong enough to to uh, recapitalize it. You know, we'll see. But I think there's an opportunity to buy virtually every great asset in the state. And so we were able to accumulate some, you know, wonderful assets. And in 1994, convinced Merrill Lynch to take us public and teeny tiny in today's terms. But at that time, it was the largest REIT IPO in history. Why did you want to go public? Uh, access access to capital. Okay. You had more ideas than you had capital, basically. Right. It was very hard to, it was hard to find the capital. It was hard to find the people to even work for me because you had all these bodies washed up on the beach yeah. <laughs> from the eighties. Yeah. And they're like, I'm not going back into real estate. Yeah. I just got toasted. You know, I had to file personal bankruptcy. There were all kinds of stories. So it was really hard to even assemble the talent. We're going to talk about how your careers progressed and, and a lot of the similarities you said, but you said something when you were saying the Crescent, you said, I knew it was a building that was quality and that would lease. And I would imagine that same thesis plays true into some of the things you're doing today. But how did you know at the time? Maybe just the question is, what do you know that other people don't know about assets like these and why they lease? You know, I didn't have any particular expertise. Uh, uniquely, I had a short stint in Houston working for one of the largest developers, certainly in that region, if not the country, a guy named Kenneth Schnitzer. And so I had a, a short background in real estate. Yep. Um, and then I had this incredible insight hanging around Roger and his team of people who were recruiting and negotiating leases recruiting companies and negotiating leases in our in our backyard. So I had it, it's not a complicated business. Yeah. You know, you know what building is, you know a good location when you see it. I think almost anybody can. 
Uh, you know great amenities when you see them. You know great architecture when you see it. And you combine all those things, and you've probably got a good asset that you want to own at the right price. Yep. Okay, so you go public in 94. You keep accumulating. Let's just kind of talk about 2007. Did you know you wanted to sell or did Morgan Stanley send an email? How did this whole thing start to build? Was it quick? Did it build over time? Well, um, first of all, the we had a very interesting yet complex portfolio. Okay. Uh, we had a, a bit of a unique structure in the REIT sector that, you know, I would say we kind of had a hall pass to buy a lot of different types of assets. Okay. Um, so we had, you know, an interest in the largest cold storage business in North America. We had, um, at one point, we were in behavioral health care oh, wow. with owning facilities for the largest behavioral health care company. Okay. Um, we, you know, we owned office properties. We owned hospitality assets. We owned part of Canyon Ranch. So we had this very disparate um, collection of assets, great assets, but. It was a wide variety. So there weren't a lot of natural buyers for a company like that. Wall Street preferred highly focused portfolios. Um, but that just wasn't what we were. And that was not our, that wasn't my upbringing yep. uh, with Richard. So we tended to buy what we thought was cheap at the time. And I was at a Morgan Stanley conference in late uh, 2006. And I was get, at the time I was getting offers on so many of our assets at prices that made no sense to me. And at the same time, I wasn't finding anything interesting to invest in. Everything seemed overpriced. Yeah. I can't say I was smart enough to see what was about to happen in 2007, but things just didn't feel right. Yep. And I have my entire net worth on the line. Still uh, to that day. Yeah. Wow. And I thought, you know, this is, this is a time we really need to think about selling this company. Yep. And I was at this Morgan Stanley conference and they really liked our team. They really liked our collection of assets. And I started talking to them and then that led ultimately to them uh, making an offer. And that was very important that they had, you know, a very large business in what was called Mesref, Morgan Stanley Real Estate Funds. Okay. They managed tens of billions of dollars. Okay. And so the offer came in ultimately from Mesref. Okay. But it was a fund to be formed. The fund had not been raised yet. Okay. And I said, look, I can't take that to my board. I've got to have a Morgan Stanley corporate guarantee. And they said, we've never given that. Over a long period of time, I don't remember, but a month of negotiating, I was able to ultimately get a Morgan Stanley corporate guarantee. Thank goodness, because that's ultimately who bought the company. Yep. They did not get their fund raised. Yep. So Morgan Stanley corporate had to close the deal on August 3rd in 2007. So it was, um, it was very difficult, honestly, to convince the board back in early 2007 to sell the company. They said, look, you're doing a great job. The company's growing. Just keep doing it. Yep. And I said, I'm telling you, we need to take this offer. This is just in my gut. This is the right thing to do. And ultimately, I traded in the most recent option or uh, compensation plan that I'd been given. Um, I said, look, I'll get I'll put that back on the table. You take it back. I really mean this. We need to sell the company. And I think that triggered the board. To realize I really meant business. Yeah, yeah. And we needed to do this. And so, you know, we got consensus to sell it. I don't really know what the question is, but something's coming to me is you obviously sit on boards now. You built this great company, did everything right, but still had a board that at first glance didn't agree with you. Is the answer if a CEO is in that position, it's kind of the passion you say it and the way you say it and backing it up? Or like, how do you get that message across when you're so deeply convicted and you're kind of up against a board that isn't feeling it quite yet? I think um, clearly if you have alignment with the shareholders, which I definitely did. Yep. I had a lot of alignment. Um, that's 
first and foremost. And, you know, I think the right collection of board members will see that and, you know, they're going to they're going to vote with that knowledge and that that backdrop. But I think um, compensation plans can skew that thinking. And in this case, we had just been awarded a new plan and it was almost, you know, I could if I put myself in their shoes, I thought they're thinking you just got this plan. You want to trigger it and monetize it. And it was worth a lot of money. Yep. Tens of millions of dollars. Yep. And I said, I put all that back. I said, you can take it all back. This is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. When were you at that conference? You know, I don't remember the exact date, but it was late 2006. Okay, so early, it took about a year. Yeah, late 2006. Maybe it was early 2007, but I think the real heat of the discussion started in like March. And if you remember, Equity Office sold somewhere in there, so that was a big trade. And then we were really the last big trade that got done. Was there anything looking back on that trade that you would have done differently in hindsight? Any no. lessons learned? You, no. You, you'd do it the same way again. <laughs> Maybe faster if I could. <laughs> uh. um, and there was a question that came in, um, and it was something to the degree of, would you and Crescent have been better had you never sold Morgan and just held on all along? No. Uh, it was the right decision. Okay. And I want to say one thing. It Morgan Stanley, it wasn't like they – ultimately overpaid. Yep. These were really smart people. And to this day, they're friends of mine. Yep. They're, they were very smart and they had a great business. They built a terrific business. It wasn't that they overpaid. It was all a function of timing. Yep. And it was a function of being over leveraged. They put up about a billion one of equity okay. in a six and a half billion dollar acquisition. Yep. And I said, you can't run a real estate business on that amount of leverage. Yep. You guys do what you want, but it won't work. It just can't stand the test of time. And it didn't. So it was shortly thereafter that they ran into trouble. And in 2009, I was able to buy the company back in partnership with the lender that had lent $3.7 billion, which was Barclays Bank. What is the appropriate amount of leverage to run a real estate company? Depends on the asset, depends on the cash flow characteristics of the asset. But I mean, generally speaking, it's probably 50%. Okay. Just rough rule of thumb. But that's all a function of timing and the asset category. I mean, obviously, I think apartments have shown they can stand the test of time, perhaps industrial. And so, you know, can you ooch the leverage up and make it work? Sure. Yep. Um, The office business, got to keep it fairly low levered. Hospitality relatively low levered um you built this company i guess you sold 2007 so i'm doing quick math you started in the 80s though right you went public in 94 so let's call it 20 years really started it in the early 90s okay yep and went public in 94 uh really bought you know the key assets in in fact the the crescent closed ultimately with buying all the banks out, which that's a whole nother podcast. Okay. Um, into, in, uh, in 94. Okay. So yeah, that is a whole nother podcast. Um, okay. What was it like waking up the day after you sold this company that you'd been building for 20 years? Were you, did you still have to work on the business or advise it? Or were you given carte blanche to go start doing other things? Well, and the one thing I told Morgan Stanley, they wanted me to run the company okay. afterwards, and they wanted to roll up a lot of their North American operations underneath it because we had a really good team, great yeah. team. And I said, look, I will consider doing that, but not until a day after closing yeah, because I've got to be in that boardroom to get this deal done. Right. And I don't want to be conflicted that I'm negotiating some deal for myself. Yeah. So there, I literally said there will be no discussions about that. But the day after, or the week after, let's call it, we we cut a deal for me to run the company. And I did that for a couple of months. Yep. But honestly, it was a square peg round hole. Yep. Um, they had this massive organization. Their tendency is they send all these asset managers in there to support you and help you. And it was a lot of newly minted MBAs. You know, I've 
<laughs> I, I say this affectionately, but, you know, suspenders, cufflinks at the time, and, you know, they're 20 years my younger. And I finally just said, time out. Yep. You know, I flew up to New York. These were friends of mine. And I said, look, you guys are paying me a fortune. I feel like I'm running the post office. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm having to uh, answer to a lot of people and you're not listening to what I'm really telling you. And you got to sell things as fast as humanly possible. And you don't need me to, to do this. Yep. So I stepped aside. I said, I'll tear the agreement up. You don't owe me a nickel. You know, and I'm just going to go really gin up my family office, which I did. All right. 08 comes and goes. We kind of know that story. Let's kind of tell the story of just buying it back, though. Did this take a year? Were you sitting on a beach somewhere and got your phone ring? How did this start? Well, before we go into that story okay. real quick, um, Back when I was running Crescent, there was a point in time in 97 okay. when Richard came to me and he said, John, I want you back to help run or to run Rainwater Inc. Oh, wow. I, I want you back in. Let, let's go do. Let's go find the next big thing. Okay. And he said, you've done a great job with the company. Stock was at an all time high. We had raised a lot of capital. We just closed a $750 million capital raise, you know, which was one of the largest ever in the REIT sector. Um. And so I did that and okay. we turned it over to the number two guy, um, turned Crescent over to, yeah. Okay. And I stayed on the board, but during that time period, this was during, um, immediately what happened is we ran into the, you know, the Asian financial crisis and then the Russian ruble crisis, long-term capital, um, failed. If you remember that, yep. and all of a sudden the debt markets were in disarray. So here was a big contrarian bet. Let's go buy debt. And so I, I tried to do it with Crescent, but Crescent didn't really have that right team. So I created another team and that team is with me still today and is actually part of Crescent, okay. which I'll, I'll get to. Um, but I created a business that became uh, ultimately the largest buyer of B pieces in the CMBS sector and so we and it did really well i mean we bought a lot of debt at the right time paid a decent price and made great returns okay so you fast forward when i go back to 2000 late 2007 i've got this great debt team mm. and all of a sudden the debt markets are looking really interesting again to participate in so we became, we quickly became large buyers of distressed real estate debt and did some really interesting transactions in that period. So I had the family office. I got this really neat, smart debt buying business, some really smart people. And um, we did some very interesting transactions. And then I get a call in uh, 2009 from Barclays Bank and they said, do you have an interest in buying Crescent back? It looks like we may get the keys back. And I said, sure, but you're not going to like the price. So um, I met with them. We put together a complete, you know, what I would call an operator's manual of what you would do with the company, every asset by asset, if we were to own it. I went that went through that with them. And they said, you know, great book. Love to have it. There's no way we're selling you the company for the number you gave. And I said, great, we'll take the book because that's going to be your operating manual when you get it back. And just <laughs> I'm telling you, that's what you do. And my team was furious with me for doing that. They said, well, why, why did you give them that? And I said, I don't know. It just felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. That book made its way all the way to London to one of the senior people that like the number two or three guy in the bank. He calls me one day and says, hey, John, I want to meet you. I read this book. It's amazing. Uh, very nice of you to share it with us. And I just want to meet you. So I said, sure. So I, we met the next day in New York or a few days later. And within 24 hours, cut a deal to partner. He said, I don't want to sell the company to you. I want to partner with you. Mm -hmm. 
And it was one of their largest distressed loans in the bank. And Barclays is a big bank. Yep. And we hit it off and um, we did a deal within 24 hours and partnered and, and bought the company. And it was it was funny in that discussion. Uh, they had just bought Lehman Brothers and the meetings were all held in the Lehman, the brand new Lehman headquarters. Oh, my gosh. And it was just uh, it was just an amazing time. I had you didn't know how to value assets at that moment. Yep. It was impossible to value a real estate asset. So we were kind of guessing, but we structured a deal that that I felt would work. And anyway, there uh, this this gentleman who um, was he was really smart and had a lot of seniority and was able to make calls on the you know on the on the flash right there in the meeting. He said something you still don't seem comfortable with the deal. And I said, I said, I'm not I, uh, for one reason. And I said, the, the issue that I faced when we sold the company to Morgan Stanley is that suddenly I thought I was going to continue to be able to run things. And all of a sudden I had all these people interfering with decision-making and that's just not my style. I don't need a job. I don't want a job. Yep. And he said, Oh, that's easy. He said, we'll have a five member board. You get three seats. I get two. You can do whatever you want. And it was a great decision. I mean, this guy, for whatever reason, he trusted me Yep. and it worked out really well. We ultimately gave Barclays all their original loan back plus interest plus a profit. That's awesome. And you, and you had a pathway to own, to eventually buy it all out and own it. Correct. Yeah. Once you got them paid off. Yeah. All right, we're not going to skip over this owner manual. We don't have to make the whole podcast about what was in it, but you guys essentially went through every asset, said, here's what your problems are, and here's what we do to fix them. Were the pro and if you took leverage out of it, which was obviously the problem, it was eating up all the cash. If you took that out of it, what else might you have said that said, this is how we can get this going again? Yeah, it was more um, asset by asset. Do you hold it? Do you renovate? Got it. Do you retenant it? Do you sell it? Yep. It was in when might you do that and specifically what needs to be done. So you make this deal, book comes back, give it to the team, and those are kind of the marching orders. Yeah, we we resurrected the team. We did a little cleanup of the organization. Uh, I brought in a lot of the kind of the younger up and coming talent that had left when we sold Crescent. Yep. I brought everyone said, I mean, to the person when I called them and said, Hey, you want to come back? I've got the company back. Every one of them said, done. We're in. Tell me when to show up. And it was, uh, so we had a great team. And to this day, we still have a lot of that talent still in the company. We also have a lot of new young talent, which is also vibrant and terrific. This is, um, you're starting to now, as we progress through the story, the blending of you and who Richard Rainwater is starting to get closer. So Richard's great at spotting talent and kind of spinning up teams. You just kind of said in that period, you went and got it. And we can talk about your other businesses because it's going to, by the end of this episode, people will have a full uh, view of this. But when you have an idea, how do you actually go put together that team? Do you already know the person that you want to run? distressed debt? Do you call a headhunter and say, give me the best person you've ever known? How do teams kind of spin up that you're comfortable with in ideas that you haven't played in yet? I would say more often than not, a person shows up with a great idea and I really like and connect with the person. Yep. And, you know, I think I ripped that page out of Richard's playbook. Yep. That's the way he operated. Um, and so it tends to work that way more than some other way. I mean, you, you interviewed Wilkie Collier. Yep. Wilkie was in my office, young guy right out of school, didn't know anything. Uh, ultimately, he had a real uh, interest in the energy sector. So I said, get after it, learn it. I introduced him to some people that I knew in it, and he spent a lot of time. And ultimately, we built a, you know energy investment around Wilkie. Yep. All right. 
I think let's, um, unless there's anything else we're going to talk about crescents, particularly in those days, I think before we talk about the crescent that we have today, it would be important to hear how you're viewing today's real estate market. You could take that however you want. We can talk about it broadly. We can talk about just what you're, excuse me, what you're invested in. What's going on right now besides the obvious that rates are through the roof? Which we can talk about that. Yeah. Wow. Where do I take that? I can go a lot of different directions here. I mean, first of all, I, I think um, I think the Fed is pushing on a string. Uh, there's seven trillion dollars of programs, three different programs that you know, from the so-called Inflation Reduction Act <laughs> and a whole <laughs> host of other programs that the federal government is spending money on, mountains of money like we've never seen before. And best I can account of the seven trillion they've announced, they've probably spent something like two and a half. Mm. And that's created to say that hasn't created inflation is totally ignoring the elephant in the room. Yep. It has created a big part of this inflation. And the Fed adjusting interest rates is not going to squash the power of that seven trillion dollars coming at us. We're seeing it spent. I mean, it's it's everywhere. It's bridges and roads and it's being spent not efficiently, but it's being spent and it will create inflation. And it is. So I don't think there's anything the Fed can do here to combat that. That's is that real quick? I don't mean to interrupt. Is that because one, it's a lot, and then the government pays the most for their services, so it's just inflationary, just on what government um, can pay for all of this stuff. Yeah, and they're crowding out the private sector. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's 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 a real issue, and it's all politically driven. And generally, you can take any economic problem we have and trace it back to some political thing. Yep. Uh, the, the whole uh, uh, real estate collapse in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, you can really trace back to probably tax policy. Yep. You know, the ability to write off um, without investing kind of an equal amount of capital. So, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Okay. So we talked about, uh, we're talking about the market. So you've, you're kind of talking about inflation. What else is going on in the market? Yeah. So in the real estate market, um, it, it's, we've got a lot going on really like never before. The, the migration I talked about in the nineties pales in comparison to what's going on now. Okay. So you've got a massive migration of our population in the usage of real estate. So if we're sitting here in this hotbed of in-migration here in the state of Texas, there are other states that are, you know, facing similar economic booms as a result of this in-migration. So real estate is, you know, I wouldn't touch real estate in San Francisco. I wouldn't touch real estate in Los Angeles. I wouldn't touch real estate in Manhattan. Not right now. I'm not saying forever, but right now, no. Um, so there's a really interesting opportunity to invest in these markets, which we're doing, uh, where people are moving to, not from. And it's all it's all a function of government policy. You know, they're moving to states that are business friendly, uh, and you know, it's just a it, it's a it's having a profound effect. Um, so not all markets are created as equal as they ever were. Uh, there's, there's more disparity in markets like I've never seen. More disparity in assets. If you take the office business, for example, it's as bifurcated as I've ever seen it. There are office properties I would not touch at any price. I don't know what happens to them. I think we're going to have to put rocket engines on some of these downtown buildings and get <laughs> Elon to shoot them into space. Um, <laughs> There, there, I don't know what, you know, we say there, there's a lot of talk about turning everything into apartments and there will be that there will be those opportunities. And I hope there are more than I think there are. I think that opportunity is a bit overstated. 
but it's wonderful if we can do it because we definitely have a shortage of housing in the country. But there are a lot of properties that just don't have the right amenities. They don't have um, the right location. They're not designed in a way that allows companies to attract and retain talent. Everything, everything now in real estate demand in the office sector is all about attracting and retaining talent. So where do you do that? Well, very few older buildings do that. Most young, talented people want to be in the newest product. Uh, they don't want to be in tall cylinders. They want to, They like being a little more spread out. Um, the Crescent is a unique example of an older building that really still works in an amazing way. And so we still get, you know, some of the highest rents um, and it's full, but it's, it's spread out, got lots of amenities, easy to get in and out of, great parking, wonderful location within the city. Um, but you can go right across Woodall Rogers into downtown and their buildings. I don't know that they'll ever lease. Um, so, and, and look, there are examples of developers doing really smart things and retrofitting, and that's great. And there's going to be those opportunities. But for the most part, uh, there's a real disparity in that sector. So we, we're actually focused on a real opportunity that's highly contrarian, but to focus on the office, sec office sector, but at the very high end. Okay. The best, the newest, the highest quality where people want to be because – Attracting and retaining talent is everything. Okay. And you and you can almost, I mean, this is an overstatement, but you can't pay enough rent for that. Our little building here in Fort Worth, yeah. 170,000 square feet, you're going in there. Why are you going in there? It's the I best. It's, it's the best. And we're charging rents that are, I probably shouldn't be telling my customer this, but I mean, we're charging, you know it. Yeah. I mean, you, you're in the business. But we're charging rents that are almost two times anything else in the city. You can go downtown and they can't give it to you. Or you can go to your building and you're paying double, if not triple, where you were in your last building. And, and you're happy full. with it. Yep. And we're full. And by the way, it's not that we're profiting. It, it requires that rent to really get an acceptable return given what debt costs today, what construction costs are today. It takes that rent. So it's a it's a fifty to sixty dollar of sixty dollars probably today yeah. um, per square foot rent to justify new construction of high quality. And I won't spoil it here, and I don't think I'm saying anything that's not. But you might be one of the only, maybe not the only, but uh, office developers in the country that might have a, a building in the queue that might already have a pretty good pre lease to it. It's not even out of the ground yet. We're not. I, I hope that's the case. We're um, we're certainly working on it. It's that's a great submarket. Yep. Fort Worth is um, Fort Worth is a very interesting market that I think is on the verge of highly significant growth. But I hope we do it in the right ways. Yep, we're going to talk about that. Um, I said, uh, there's one thing that I think we just need to touch on because we share this opinion and you've said it in, in other speaking, but we're talking about people going to an office, the best office. The narrative I've been hearing is, oh, let's everybody work from your bedroom and your hoodie and your socks and pretend like you're working. Why do you believe that's probably not the future, or at least for the businesses that might be the best ones that we see come out of COVID or whatever we're in? There are certain businesses that may be able to operate that way, but I will tell you this. Um, I learned to use Teams and Zoom and all these different um, different packages, you know, during the COVID period. And all of our companies, I think we we learn to use that and effectively process things and keep businesses running. But I can categorically say. Not one great new business idea came off a Zoom call yeah. in our in our businesses. Not one. We process things. We move businesses along. We made decisions, but we didn't come up with great ideas. That all happened spontaneously, face to face, interacting, scribbling on whiteboards, 
And that's that's the way we work. And I think most businesses work that way. Yep. So I'm finding more and more companies working really hard to get their get getting the key people back together. And I think sheer competitive pressure yep. is going to force that to happen at some level. I'm not saying that there hasn't been a sustainable or a sustaining uh work from home thing or you know it's four days a week or three days i don't know um i don't think it's going to be as profound as everyone says i think it's human nature you want to be you want to interact and that's how energy and enthusiasm and collaboration and all these things occur that are the genesis of great businesses for sure we haven't even talked about the young people how they get mentorship and how they grow up in a business. Yeah. I can't imagine your first day after college, your first day of work is in your bedroom. No. Um, and I think you'll start seeing that in the results. You got two friends that maybe left college. One went to work for an in-office and one didn't. And five years later, they're wondering why one's somewhere in the world and another maybe isn't. I think work from home will prove that the level of mentorship and just learning people skills and lingo and nuance and how to have those whiteboard sessions. It seems kind of cliche, but it's true. I think it works. I, I think so too. And look, I have fun. I mean, I, yeah. I don't need to work anymore. I'm 68 years old, um, but I have fun. I get energy by being in that office with all this youth and vigor and, you know, hungry people. It's, I love it. I thrive off that. It keeps me alive. Uh, contrarian words come up a bunch and you just said, there's just some buildings that I don't know at any price you could buy. That's kind of an interesting statement. Um, I think, you know, you talk to some people, it's actually worth negative because you have to actually demolish the building. If you want to get back to the land, um, you don't have anything more to add to that, that even at zero dot, like what will happen? I mean, there are thousands, I mean, of these buildings. But yeah, I'm, I've seen some turned into storage centers that were, you know, they housed workers not that long ago. And now yeah. they store people's excess furniture and mattresses and who knows what. I I don't know. Um, I don't I don't see that as a real interesting opportunity as a real estate investor trying to retrofit things. Yep. You know, would I retrofit a tower that could readily be adapted to an apartment sure yeah I'd, i would look at that but i think that opportunity's overstated yep. because even in that sector people want amenities and they want you know the right light they want so that a lot of times just the sheer depth of office buildings don't it doesn't equate to a light filled um apartment that would be something most people would want to live in right. so it's I think there's just there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, buildings that are just going to ultimately have to be torn down. Yep. I think it's going to be a lot of that. Okay. I also think about all these darn parking garages. Okay. And I, I hate building parking garages. It's a necessary evil whenever we do a project. I know you face the same thing. Yep. But. More and more, we're thinking about uh, how are we going to retrofit this space when in 10 to 20 years, it probably is not going to make a lot of sense. Right. You know, they're not going to be as necessary as they are today. Yep. Um, I've often thought for the cost of building a parking space, you can probably underwrite for 10 to 20 years a, you know, an Uber receipt to send those people to and from the office and you come out ahead as a landlord yep. than building the darn space, particularly if I have to go down subterranean. So it's city required. It's, it's we won't, we won't go into yeah, city code because yeah, that's exactly. a whole nother podcast. We could have like 10 podcasts out of this one. Um, okay. On the, on the class double a office opportunity, that's Sunbelt markets pro uh, pro growth markets. I will ask one question. What would it, what would you need to see to, uh, and maybe it's just, look, I got plenty to say grace over in, in the markets that we're in, but uh, to go back into New York, L.A., San Francisco, is it a change in government? Is it a change in policy? Is that like the thing or is there something that you would need to see to go? I will put dollars to work in these markets. Policy and government. Yeah. OK. Um, are you going to be building these buildings? Or are you going to be buying and just 
going all out and making these knockout buildings? Primarily buying. Um, and I, look, I think it's a it's going to be a limited time in a limited number. Yeah, I mean, we have a we have, again, our yellow pad, a modern day yellow pad. Yeah. Um, list of what we were we were willing to own okay. and where. And it's a relatively short list. Okay. And it doesn't encompass, you know, every brand new building. It's a select few and select markets. Um, highly focused strategy. And it's I don't think this opportunity is around long. And look, we're not going to be stealing them. Yeah. This isn't this isn't the early nineties or yeah, the early nineties. This is it's a different opportunity, but I think we can make very attractive buys. Okay. Uh, to the extent you can talk, why did you decide to raise the, your last few vehicles in a GP fund format? I've I've been the beneficiary of getting to learn more about how it's done. We're in the process of maybe looking at doing one ourselves, um, but you've done one, you did a second one, and it's been kind of all the rage around town, but why was this the format for you? Fundamentally, I don't want to be sitting on two, three, four, five billion dollars mm -hmm. and having to put it to work because I think that causes us to do uh, make bad decisions. Um, we want to stay fundamentally contrarian, opportunistic, and I think it's hard to do that with a mountain of money staring you in the face and a big institution wanting you to go put it to work. Yeah. Um. Number two, if you rate when you raise money like that, at least what I have found is that you tend to get pigeonholed. These big institutions are going to want you to do stay in a particular lane, a particular sector, particular geographic focus. That's not what we do. Uh, we find areas that are, um, you know, we think uh, contrarian or have the wind at their back and that's where we want to go. And those places change. They're not always, it's not always the same place. So we need the flexibility and the GP fund gives us that. Okay. It gives us high flexibility and it doesn't, it's not burn. It's, it's not capital burning a hole in our pocket that we got to go put to work. Right. Um, okay. Let's talk about oil and gas for a bit. Um, you're, You've gone on the record and said you think it's the trade of a lifetime. Uh, I talked to a friend the other day that said in the environment we're in today in certain parts of the world, you could tell people you own a porn company and they would like you more than if you told them you owned an oil company. And you've gone on to say this might be one of the greatest trade opportunities you've ever seen. Can you just set up what is actually happening from your view of how the landscape looks and why we might be in that period? Well. First of all, you can usually find wonderful opportunities where you find a lot of government policy um, that is causing irrational behavior. And in the case of the energy sector, it's there in spades. Um, the whole, um, I don't want to get into climate thesis uh, because, look, I think we all need to be doing the right things for our environment totally on board with that. Yep. But the way we're going about this energy transition makes zero sense. And it's filled with politicians and politics. It's not based on fact or science or math. And I'm all about that. So it's really a shame that the opportunity is as big as it is, but it's here and it's staring us in the face and I'm, I love investing in it. Um, we started in it about 2015 okay. and we owned virtually, we had no exposure to the energy, energy sector at that moment in time. And it became very oversold, um, over leveraged. There were too many companies. There was too much GNA. And so I thought it was an interesting time to enter the sector. So we started making investments. We did that public through public uh, securities. We bought distressed debt. We bought equities, both high quality equities as well as distressed equities. And that led to one probably a very important transitional trade for us, which was Resol uh, Resolute Energy, where we became 
um, the largest shareholder and the largest unsecured bondholder. Um, everyone thought the company was going to go out of business. We met with the management team. We flew around the country, looked at every asset, and we said, I said, look, they're not going to go out of business. These guys are going to do what they said. And they did. And stock went from a dollar to its sale to Simmerex for 36. Um, unsecured debt traded from 30 cents to par. And it was, you know, it was a wonderful investment um, led by, you know, a great management team. Um, small, but for us, it was meaningful. Yep. And then that led to another investment. Um, but w- which is now the the company that I'm chairman of, Crescent Energy, which was a, a merger of a small public company we had an interest in called Contango with all of KKR's energy assets, which went under the name Independence Energy. And they, uh, it was a wonderful meeting with them or wonderful dinner where they said, we really want to name it after your legacy at Crescent Real Estate because it had a great track record as a public company. Let's name it Crescent Energy. So that's where a lot of our investing uh, or focus on oil and gas is. And I'm, uh, I'm super excited about it. But getting back to the thesis, um, we have not reached peak demand. We're nowhere near peak demand. And you can simply look at now four different population groups on the planet that have roughly a billion four people. You've got China, India, Southeast Asia, and now Africa. Each of those consume far less oil per capita than we do in the U.S. and Europe, far less. And, but they're all growing in that usage. We are a long way away from reaching peak demand. And so we're foolish to say we're, <laughs> I, you know, I keep reading these reports. It is just, they're just wrong. And it doesn't take <laughs> long, it doesn't take much research. It doesn't take much reading to read the real science of what's going on and looking at the math of world population and coming to that conclusion. It's not hard. And to think we're going to make this magical transition in a period, whether it's 2030 or 2050, depending on what politician you want to talk to, um, is it, it's nonsense. And it's it's not only nonsense, it's dangerous. Because really all we're doing is we're substituting one form of mining with another. And the disruption after all the science and technology that's been put into oil and gas drilling, which has actually become pretty darn efficient and effective, and and our modern day engines can burn with, you know, a lot less pollution and carbon emissions than ever before. All of this, need, it, it, there needs to be a thoughtful overall approach because the mining that is done and is going to have to be done to get all of the minerals to create all of the batteries is it's mind boggling. And then you look at the disruption of the environment of windmills. And, you know, I go out to my ranch here west of town and I look out on the horizon, all I see is windmills. Yep. It's so disruptive and it's, it's sad. It's sad that we're going down that path. Um, without appro- going to the appropriate scientific and, again, just simple math and see that there's a much more thoughtful way to create an energy transition. But out of all that, that's all another podcast. Yep. And we'll I, read that a lot, number four. I'll, I'll, I read a lot about all that, and I'm very passionate about it. Yep. Um, but out of all that, there's a wonderful time to invest in oil and gas and it's right now how how do you see more capital coming in is this just going to be it's like shell entities going to be created so you can kind of get in without having to tell anybody you're in or what's going to happen because the choke off of capital is also part of this thesis there's just no money in it like there used to be it it's it's a real issue um and you know we're designing Crescent Energy to not be dependent on the banks because the banks are going out the exit door. Yeah. So we're really focused on um, being an unsecured borrower in the in the bond markets, 
and we want to quickly get to an investment grade credit rating. Yeah. So we're building a very strong balance sheet so that we can do that. You know, and I think we'll be there in short order, but we've already tapped into the unsecured markets in a pretty meaningful way. And we're not dependent on the banks because you can't be. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see at some point, I'm not about to predict when, we're going to see some pretty significant spikes in pricing. And it's going to force politicians to address it and to create a mechanism for lenders and investors to get back into it. I mean, you're already seeing, you know, like entities like BlackRock who just made, you know, in my opinion, boneheaded uh, political decisions that had nothing to do with smart investing. Yep. Say, you know, we're getting totally out of oil and gas. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, you have states say, well, we're withdrawing our money. So I think you have to ultimately you have to uh, look at capital flows and those will force decisions to allow capital back into the industry. Um, you know, if the state of Texas and other states who have vested interest in oil and gas say, well, if you're going to put a big X on that industry, we're not going to let you manage any of our capital. Yeah. That will influence them to make a different decision. Yep. Yeah, the thing I think, again, this is that would be podcast number four. The thing that just irritates me and I could go on and on. Um, you know, you get a group like BlackRock that's invested in America preaching one message to us, but they're invested in China and China's spinning up a coal factory every four or five days. For every one we shut down, they open seven. They open seven. And uh, I, when you talk to people, it's like, America doesn't just have the space above it, and that's what we control. We're one globe with one climate for the most part. Right. And so for every, uh, you know, uh, gas stove we shut down in California, there's six coal plants being. It, it's just, it's mind boggling to me. And what gets me the most is the same capital that's in these companies is also in the companies doing the exact opposite across the world. Right. Um, in I would love to ask some of these investors, have you ever flown over a mine in the Congo? Um, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of research to see the damage it's creating to our environment of massively increasing, you know, the mining capacity to create Tesla batteries. Yep. You just talked about getting corporate rating. I think my just one question is, what does the market not understand about Crescent that you understand? I think the biggest uh, headwind we've had is our partnership with KKR. I've done a lot of business with KKR. I have a great degree of respect for them. And there has been a, you know, the, the way the, the company is organized is it's technically managed via this management agreement with KKR. Okay. That has been a, a difficult uh, thing to, to explain and sell through. The reality is, and we looked at this intensely because to make the trade, that was an important part of the trade. Right. First of all, KKR has zero interest in selling their shares. They're in this for the long term because they have difficulty. They're not going to be able to raise any other capital um, to do future funds for oil and gas investing. Part of our agreement is all new oil and gas deals that come to them go to our company. Okay. So we have the benefit of that deal flow, which is quite amazing. Yep. Um, in addition, we have the power of all that talent in uh, and, and smarts and expertise that they have within their organization, you know, it's right at our fingertips. And it's, that's very powerful. But the market likes having all the management within the company and, you know, full clarity on what every person is paid and all that. And I, and I get it. I mean, that's, that's, that's nice. But the reality is the overall GNA of our company, which is embodied in that fee. Yeah is right in line with what the industry pays if you have all the people inside the company. Yep. So my argument is I got a lot I got access to better expertise than most companies of our size. Right. And I'm paying a market rate for it. I like it. Yep. I'm I, I love the structure, but I think it's gonna take 
it just takes time for the market to get comfortable with that. We also, we, we've had very low trading volume in the stock simply because it's been so closely held. Right. So until recently, we only traded like $4 million worth of stock a day. I mean, less than 5 million bucks. It was, it's very small. Yep. So it's not efficiently traded. That's changing, and we have specific plans to change that over time. So I think as we have more trading volume, it's going to attract more institutional interest. And once you attract institutional interest, then I think we're going to be trading at a more, um, you know, a, a market rate multiple. And I'm looking forward to that day. But yeah. it's our stock being, I think the stock is incredibly cheap right now. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely not interested in trading. This is a long-term vehicle for me. This is where I want, you know, all my energy investing focused on. And I'm having fun working with the team. We have a great team. David Rockchar is a very smart guy, tons of experience, and he's got a terrific team. He's a good leader, uh, good investor, good instincts. So um, I'm excited about it. Okay. Canyon Ranch. Yeah. Um, this, you know, we just got off of oil and gas, which is, is, is we called it maybe a trade of a lifetime, but in some of our conversations, you think this one might be one of the most meaningful deals you ever do, not just maybe profitably, but just it's kind of what people need. So we've talked about office, we've talked about oil and gas, maybe we'll get to crypto. I mean, if anybody listening to this hasn't gotten a sense, um, we do lots of things here at Crescent. I'm saying we, um, but Canyon Ranch, let's just like talk about this because uh, it's it's obviously become a huge part of your life. And I think you're just kind of getting started with it. There was some big uh, news announced in the last few months. Yeah. Well, the investment in Canyon Ranch goes all the way back to 97. Richard actually went there, Rainwater, um, as a guest. He calls me. I was running Crescent at the time. He said, John, you got to come to this place. It's amazing. It'll change your life. And so come out here. I want to figure out how we buy it. So I went out and long story short, we, we, uh, I loved it as well. It was, to me, it was like a, an adult camp. Um, and I, I enjoy working out. I enjoy trying to stay fit. You know, I, um, and particularly at that point in my life, I was, you know, really, really into it and I was skiing a lot. And, um, anyway, we ended up making an investment. But it wasn't until recently that I gained full control of the company, just in the last few years. So now we own 100%. We own this in our family office. It's a big investment for us. Um, We have um, a new CEO, uh, Mark Rivers, who I'm very fired up about. Uh, Very smart guy, incredibly energetic, great ideas. And we're, you match him in this legacy team that we have with all this talent and now the capital that we've negotiated with our partner Vici, V-I-C-I, which is a public company, New York Stock Exchange, $50 billion plus REIT run by uh, Ed Petoniak. And Ed is a terrific guy. He understands this brand as well as anybody. He's personally spent along with his team a lot of time at our locations. Um, and I was just with him, uh, in Vegas where we have operate the largest spa, I think in the world is 130,000 square feet in the Venetian, Hmm. which is an amazing place. We have over a hundred treatment rooms. Um, we were with him and, and, uh, his team, and we were talking about, you know, where we're going to take the company, but basically they're giving us the capital to become a asset light business. So we no longer have to own the resorts. They'll own them. They'll lease them to us. Mm. And this will free up capital for us to invest not only in the properties to make them better and fresher and newer and cutting edge, but also enable us to expand and buy new resorts. So we're really our focus is to take the the two wellsprings, Tucson and Lenox. We're going to really be doing significant upgrades there. We have a smaller version of Canyon Ranch in Woodside, California. Um, And then we're opening up our first urban club, which we're going to do 
urban clubs throughout the country, but the first one's here in Fort Worth because it's our home court and we're going to kind of get the recipe right. The next one will be in Houston, then probably Austin, and we'll expand from there. We're doing a new resort in Austin. Vici's giving us the capital to do that. It's underway. It'll open in 2025. Um, I am super excited about this. This brand has been vibrant and profitable for years, but it's now more relevant than it ever has been. It's really interesting. Back in, um, I don't remember the exact year, but it was after Eisner exited Disney. I knew Michael through Richard. Michael called me and he said, he said, John, you're an investor in Canyon Ranch. And I said, yeah, through Crescent, you know, we own a minority interest. And he said, well, I've done a survey of emotional brands. And he said, interesting that he said, Disney's the number one emotional brand in the, in the world. He said, one of the other highest rated emotional brands came out to be Canyon Ranch. He goes, I want to see it. I want to understand it. Anyway, I ended up spending time with Michael Eisner because he was focused on how, you know, he might invest in the business. We didn't end up doing a deal, but it was quite interesting that a guy of that ilk, you know, identified this as a brand he might want to invest in. And Disney itself had even looked at investing in Canyon Ranch. So it's this incredible brand. I think there's an uh, it, it's more relevant than ever because there's more and more focus on living healthier, longer. And I think, uh, you know, we're, we're on the cutting edge of that. And I think we have permission to be, you know, much bigger, broader brands. So it's one of the most interesting investment opportunities that I've seen. You can take this however you want. When we had lunch a couple months ago, I think this is, I was saving this for really what it's like to own a company and be a true entrepreneur. You own a business in the uh, hospitality, people have their hands on you. It was basically the antithesis of COVID. You woke up in March of 2020, or maybe it was late March of 2020, and you probably had a business that was the one they wanted shut down the most. Can you just walk anybody through what it's like to own a business like that? And maybe after 40 years of business, like what that experience was like for you? Because frightening. It was frightening. Frightening. That's as scared as I've ever been in my business career. Um, more scared than having securities on deposit at Bear Stearns in 2008, <laughs> uh, 2007. Um, it was frightening. Yeah. And, you know, I fortunately went into that period with a fair amount of liquidity, but I have to say I was, you know, really calculating, okay, how many months, years can I continue to keep these teams going? Because you can't let them go. Yeah. The talent in Canyon Ranch. I mean, I couldn't let these people go. Yep. You can't just say, hey, I'll see you in three years when we get through this. You, they'll find something else to do. Yeah. So. I had to retain the talent. Yep. So we just had to pay the price, buckle down. Yep. And did you wake up? What was that? To, what, what was your 60, 90 days? I think the first 60, 90 were the most traumatic because then we started, I think for me, it was like late May, early June. It was like, okay, you can kind of see where this is headed. Um, we kept being told like two more weeks and that yeah. went on for a while, but at least by May, things had softened. Can you just give any insight to like, what did the first 60 days look like for you? Were you just reading? Were you on the phone a lot? Were you calm? What did it look like? I was on the phone constantly. Yeah. Um, I'd wake up incredibly early. I, 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 I developed a routine. I would just sit in my office at home and, you know, fire up the computer and download, you know, I went to all my touch points of getting data. I'm, I'm a data nerd. Um, I'd have CNBC on, I have, you know, other broadcasts on, I was just trying to consume as much as I could to try to establish a framework for making decisions. And I also spent a lot of time talking to other people. Um, Jerry Jones is, you know, close friend. I remember having very gritty discussions with him about you know, what is he doing in his business? What are we doing? I remember talking to Bob Rowling, who owned, you know, the lots Omni. of hotels through Omni. 
um, just a variety of other business owners I would collaborate. Yeah. Talking to Henry Kravis, you know, what what are you doing with all these different businesses? And, you know, here's what I'm experiencing. What are you? It was just a fretful, um, incredibly difficult time. Yep. And then the biggest unknown is, you know, what is the government going to do? What you knew they were going to do something big and it's, it's just, but that's, there's going to be impacts to that that could be negative and, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars later, here we are with, you know, a mountain of debt and no conceivable way to pay it back. Do you think the world has changed? Uh, yeah, I think I, I think behavior has changed at some level that will probably um, stick with us. You know, I think there's always going to be that thought in the back of your head. Well, we got through that one. What might the next one be? So, yeah, I think behavior's going to change, but I I do see a lot of uh, normality. You know, back in the back in the market and travel habits and th- things are are back to normal, which is great to see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do think you know we've changed at some level. We've all seen something now that we're that is you know awoken us to uh, something that we don't control. Yeah. All right, I think the place that will bring it home um, is in our own backyard, Fort Worth. Uh, we could go on and on. This could be podcast five about why it's a great city. You've spent a lot of your career doing things outside of the city. And it, if there's a trend that I'm picking up on, you might finish your career having a component of your business being here in your own backyard. You said earlier, huge opportunity here, but there's also some buts, but challenges. So maybe describe like what the challenge or what the opportunity is and then some of the challenges. And then I really want to have a discussion of what folks my age and people in the community might be able to do to help rally the city forward. Well, look, I love the city. I moved here. I didn't grow up here. Um, moved here in 1981, literally driving a U-Haul truck from Houston um, with all my possessions. I had no net worth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I lived over in Wedgwood, a bought you know a little house, fixed it up, and didn't really know that many people here. But yeah. I had a job at you know a great accounting firm at Pete Marwick, and kind of away I went. Um, so I feel like I owe the city a lot because it has embraced me. It's enabled me to start and grow a number of businesses here. Um, I've relocated businesses here, so. Um, I love the city and the city has really grown up, you know, I've grown up kind of alongside of the city in a way. Um, it's in a very healthy way. There's a lot of new smart blood in the city, which is great to see. Um, a lot of new businesses coming in, but it was interesting when I was, you know, in the thick of COVID, you talk about that March time period. I think it was about then that I got the call from then Mayor Price to, would you co-chair this Fort Worth now to help us get through the pandemic? And then most importantly, help us get on the other side of it stronger economically. Well, I naively said yes, like I didn't already have enough to do. Um, But I took the job seriously. And, you know, I I did a lot of studying uh, on the city and tried to look at it objectively, you know, what do we really need to do to emerge more powerful? And the one thing I realized was very evident. We were the largest city in the U.S., 13th largest at the time, with no tier one research university within our confines. We have some great universities, TCU, Texas Wesleyan, UNT, but we don't have that tier one research university. We've got UT Arlington close by in Arlington, but it's not here. It's not in the city and you know i had this idea of approaching a and m who i'd met bobby audier who was running the law school and doing a great job with the law school and went to him and you know we concocted this idea of building a bigger campus and approached john john sharp and the 
leadership at A&M. And lo and behold, here we are. We're going to have this tier one research university. It's going to really grow. It's going to this is going to be a game changer for the city. I don't think most people realize how big this can be. Why? Um, I just went on a tour of several. And I'm not about to say we're going to be the size and scope of this, but I just went and looked at MIT and I took a delegation of city, county people, as well as A&M. And we looked at MIT, we looked at Penn, um, and we looked at research-oriented campuses that they had created. And it's amazing, you know, what they're doing in those locations. Um, so we're trying to look at best in class, and we're not about to say we're going to be that big to start, but we got to start somewhere. Right. So the components that A&M is bringing into the city – um, is going to be matched up with a lot of uh, corporate um, entities that are here in particular areas. Clearly, the defense industry, Lockheed, Bell Helicopter, and others, transportation, Burlington Northern, American Airlines. Um, there's a lot of interaction between engineering and science programs and what those what they need. So creating graduates here right in the metroplex it's pretty amazing allowing students out of fort worth who may not have the money or the willingness to go to college station to get a degree they can just go right here and get a degree that's going to have a meaningful impact on the city we're already bringing new businesses in as a result of this so one of them is one of our investments, a company called Probably Monsters. Crazy name, <laughs> but a very interesting business. Okay. Um, currently based in um, outside of Seattle, um, but it is a game design company. So they design video games. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. This is not a small business. Um, and they've already relocated part of their operation here into downtown right near the campus they desperately need graduates and the visualization program at a&m is going to be plug and play they can create the graduates that probably monsters needs and it's also cheaper to do business here for them it's easier for retention etc seattle's a tough place to do business it's tough it is tough so um <laughs> I'm just very excited about what this gonna this is gonna do. I'm over answering your question, and I'm going down a the, no, you know the, a specific um, example here. But I just want to say that that's very very important, and it's uh, I'm very competitive, and I will never forget one of the meetings that we had of Fort Worth. Now we I had a bunch of different committees led by different you know smart business people in the in the area. And I was sitting in on one committee meeting and there was somebody, but I don't, I don't remember who it was, but they made the comment, well, we don't have a tier one research university and we never will. Fort Worth never will. <laughs> and I was like, bullshit, <laughs> we're going to make this happen. And so um, we, we're going to, it's, it's going to be here. And I think that campus is going to be, if we look out 20, 30 years, it's going to be a lot bigger than two or three, four buildings. It's going to be much bigger than that. I have a meeting with them this afternoon. I love it. Um, all right. We've lost um, the, the we can talk about how we're going to bring businesses in. I want to just get your opinion. I have not found you speak about this or maybe you have, but I just haven't read it. We have this thing north of downtown. It's like 200 acres. It's called Panther Island. And when you usually pick up the paper about Fort Worth, like every three or four years, it's like this positive article about how we're about to do it all. And then there's like an article about how we need more funding and then we're going to do it all, need more funding, do it all. Yeah. We're 20 years late. We're a couple <clears throat> billion over budget. I'm just going to call it like it is. But you clearly have thought about this, whether it's you taking it on or somebody taking it on. In your opinion, what needs to happen to either make it what it needs to be or just let the dream go and sell it off to developers and let it develop because it's an iconic piece of land that needs something to happen. And I would just be remiss if you didn't tell me you hadn't thought about it once or twice. Well, I'm not proud of this as an American, but I will, I'm going to say it. There's enough money 
sloshing around in all this $7 trillion that I think Panther Island gets done. Okay. I just think it gets done. Okay. Um, does it get done as originally envisioned? Maybe, maybe not, but it will, it will get done at some level. And we do need some level of flood control. So there's a legitimacy backdrop to it, whether or not it needed to be this expensive. I'm not going to opine on that. Um, so I think Panther Island gets done, but I don't, I don't, and I think it, look, it can be a wonderful development opportunity. It, and I think it will be, um, but I, my pet project is A and M, yeah. And I think that has a much more profound impact, um, on the city and the shape. Companies come and go. You know, we saw that with, um, XTO, Pier One, Exxon, Pier One, Dior Horton. They can come and go. Dior Horton, but universities stay and they thrive and they create energy. And a and is a, is particularly good at that because of, you know, they're so engineering focused, application focused. Um, I think it's a perfect marriage for the city. So I don't want to get back on that, but I, for sure. I, I think that is that Trump's Panther Island. Panther Island's important from a development perspective, retail, housing, commercial, future office. But we got to have A and M. We got to have it thriving to create that demand. You're creating that demand in the culture district where Crescent is currently developing. You talk about maybe that south of downtown area where you have Omni doing Phase Two, Texas A and M coming in. I keep hearing about Hillwood maybe doing something. It sounds to me like south of downtown is, if we're looking five, ten years out, is about to become a cool place of town. Is that fair? I, I think it absolutely will be. You know, and it's so ironic because if you go back to Taylor Sheridan's, um, what is it, 1883, mm -hmm. the opening scenes, while they weren't filmed there, that's where they took place. Oh, really? That was Hell's Half Acre. Interesting. Was that, was that land? So, you know, I don't remember how many bars were in Hell's Half Acre, but it was something like 30, 40, 50 bars, you know, within a few block <laughs> area and, um, you know, whorehouses and all that, you know, it was just a, it was, it was a very, very seedy area. And it's just so ironic that now that can become, you know, perhaps one of the most vibrant parts of the city. Is there anything else about the city that comes to mind? We've talked about what you've done there. We've talked about certain areas of town, but is there something else uh, maybe we're missing that you're very optimistic about? And then I kind of want to talk about some of the challenges that you would put on our plate to try and help solve. Yeah, I, look, I'm, I'm very optimistic about um, everything that, uh, you know, Ross Pro has done up north. Yep. Um, you know, the positioning of Burlington Northern up there and a lot of the technology that's going on, that's that's huge. Um, we also have companies here that we sometimes forget about. You know, it's like Alcon. Um, David Endicott was incredibly helpful um, on my committee and in the recruitment of A&M. And there will be engagement there, but that's the number one eye care company in the world. And they're right here. People forget about it. They yeah. just happen to be on a part of town you don't go to a lot. Right. Um, so there are a lot of businesses here that people forget about. I think the biggest concern I have is, you know, I travel a lot. So I'm flying in and out of Meacham a lot. When you fly out over North Fort Worth and West Fort Worth, and I just see this sea of housing that's going in. I also see a lack of parks and cool places for people to recreate and, you know, gather together. And I worry about us not becoming just another example of urban sprawl, suburban sprawl. I worry about that. I think we've got to be really smart about it. Uh, Mayor Parker talked about that in her uh, recent State of the City. And I think did a good job of addressing it. Um, but we got to we got to keep at it. Yeah. That's really important. Um, 
And if you really want to attract great companies, you've got to offer those. And then the whole educational system here, it's broken. It's got to be fixed. Um, is it broken everywhere, though? Or is it more to Fort, is Fort Worth in a di- more dire situation? It, it's, it's broken a lot of places. But, um, you know, I I just want to see, oh, well, I want to see it fixed everywhere. But I would love to see Fort Worth fixed. You know, I go back. I'm a total product of a public education. I've never gone to a private school in my life. And I have to say, I had a really good education. My going into UT, I was, I think, very well educated by a public school system. When I add up the total tuition, because I've actually done this, that I I have paid, it's less than $1,000. It's amazing. (laughs) And not the smartest guy around, but I got a pretty good education, you know, and it's I, I I just am hopeful that we can provide that for, you know, anybody that wants it. And maybe this is podcast number seven, but how much do you think the lack the the what's going on in public education has to do with we still teach kids in most respects the way we have for a very, very long time? And the world has changed dramatically the last 20 years with resources online, YouTube, free courses. I mean, you could almost never go to school. And I'm not saying this isn't don't go to school, but you could get very educated never walking into a school if you if you tried. How much of that do you see as the problem or is that a problem at all? Well, I'm not the expert here, but uh, my gut tells me that. We're getting carried away with some of that, and we need to go back to just a lot of fundamentals. Yeah, we're get you know we're teaching math in ways that don't I don't think really work and make sense. Um, and I think some of the original ways were pretty darn good. Now, can we use technology to make it more efficient and faster, and you know, with less personality interaction? I, absolutely, and you know that needs to be done. And I think there's some really good examples of that, some of which we've looked at investing in, you know, along the way. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, there's certainly a – we got a lot to do in the education space. Yeah. All right. If you could – you've – you're still getting started in some ways. I know you have a lot of energy, but looking back – if there was something that you wish you had spent more time doing and something you wish you had spent less time doing, what would those be? Well, the one thing that I'm thoroughly enjoying is, um, and I'm not directly answering your question, but I, I, I want to bring this up because it's very important to me. Um, I have a rule in my family that anybody that wants to come and work in one of the family related businesses is welcome to do so. However, they need to bring something to the table. So they need to have gone out and done something on their own and created expertise that they then bring to the table. We're not there to train them from ground up. And my two sons, Travis and Christopher now are both doing that. So Travis is running the family office. Christopher is Uh, very engaged at Crescent and has gone from the investing side to just recently um, the capital market side and is head of capital markets. And I love that. It is so much fun to watch them thrive um, and frankly take over. Uh, They'll do a much better job than I've ever uh, thought of doing. Um, And I'm really proud of that. I'm just I'm proud of them. I love working with them. It's, awesome. it's um it's just so much fun. It's energizing. Um you know, I would say that I would probably let uh Christopher's the younger and so, you know, he's on his track. I probably have been slow to let Travis let things loose to him. I should have probably done things sooner. Yep. Um but I'm, you know, reaping those rewards of uh of time and um, just energy by seeing him, you know, thrive and take things over and, you know, have a little different perspective and, um, certainly much more contemporary at it than I am. So, yeah, I, I love that. So I'd say having that, that engagement, you know, is, is super important to me and, uh, something I'm really enjoying. 
But I do think that's a good rule that we have. Yeah. If they had just come right out of school, I don't know that it would have been as effective for them. Travis spent time on Wall on Wall Street. Christopher spent a lot of time in New York working, and um, it's so it's you know that's that's valuable. They have brought a lot to the table, and they're just getting started. It's it's been great to get to know them too. I look forward to at least learning and maybe doing something with them one day. Um, yeah, I think that's super cool. You get to do that. Yeah, I, I learn a lot every day from them. They they speak a different language. Yeah. I can't imagine what the next language coming up is. I mean, the, the young, young ones. I mean, there's. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I think that's a great way to end this conversation. You get to work with your family, do what you love to do, and you've had a wonderful career. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Enjoyed it.